Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, session today at Azure User Group Sweden. Hi, Okan. How Hello. are you? Hi, Jona. Hi, how are you? Yes, so, I'm... <laughs> uh, so I'm Hokan and this is Jonah. So we will be your host here for, for this session. And we're going to be learning about Terraform and Azure today. But before we start, we can just have a quick introduction to ourselves, I think, so you get to know us a little bit better. Yes. So Jonah, right. you, uh, she's an Azure MVP living in Sweden. But she's also an author. She's a trainer. And she's uh, also a mentor and a blogger. And also yes. a conference speaker. Yes, that's a lot of titles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yes, thank you for that, Hokan. And uh, we decided to like introduce ourselves, especially to those that are new in our user group in our community. And uh, also, want to introduce uh, Hokan Silver and Nagel. He is uh, he's working at Miles uh, as a manager for AI and uh, big data, and he's also uh, a community leader uh, here at Azure User Group Sweden. He is also a community leader at Norwegian.net user group and uh, AI42. And he's also a Microsoft MVP technical trainer and also um, also uh, like a, a partner in community. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, that's enough of introduction. But uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to us. And before we get started, we have a lot of uh, exciting things uh, coming or uh, that we will be sharing with you. First, uh, we want to share with you our uh, code of conduct. So. Uh, we want to remind everyone to uh, be nice and friendly, uh, listen with purpose and be thoughtful and be respectful to others and uh, seek to understand, not crit criticize and be curious and open to ideas and be inclusive with your comments or questions in the chat. So that's our uh, code of conduct, and thank you for uh, following us or joining us today. And uh, do you want to share about our surprise today for our learners, uh, Hokan? Yeah, if I can, if I can find I the found right it. slide there. There. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so we're actually very, very proud and very happy to be able to offer everyone who is listening to this uh, session here an Azure Learner Badge. So these uh, learner badges, you can get them by just scanning this QR code. And then you will also get some, um, some information or some instructions on how you can go about to be able to download your, your learner badge. Yes, uh, that's correct. And we would like to thank you, Microsoft, for sponsoring uh, the Azure Heroes badge for our learners. Okay, and another surprise. Okay, let me just uh, share this. Um, okay, oh, what happened there? <laughs> let me see. How do we do this? Uh, I want to share something. I want to see the old. Okay, this one. Oi. Yes. <laughs> Can, can you fix? <laughs> Yes, um, yes. I want to share with you that uh, we will be having. Uh, uh, we're trying something new today. Uh, we are inviting you to join us uh, for an after session on Zoom, uh, where you have a chance to mingle with me and Hokan and even Robert if he could uh, join us, and also just to mingle, have a coffee. If you don't drink coffee, get grab a cup of tea or something refreshing after the session. All right, without further ado, let's introduce our our speaker on the stage, Hokan. Yes. So hello, Robert. Hello. Hi, <laughs> Hi. how are you? I'm fine. Uh, you know, uh, it's early morning. Not really, but, but, but you know, <laughs> if, if, the, if the evening is late and the morning is earlier and earlier. But yeah, it, I'm doing fine. Just a little bit tired. So I'm going to try yeah. to keep the energy level up. Yes. Yeah, so a quick introduction here to, to Robert. So Robert Strand is a Microsoft Azure MVP, a HashiCorp ambassador, and the cloud architect at Crayon. And he's been working primarily with Microsoft Azure automation and infrastructure. And currently he's focusing on containers, cloud native technology, and everything as code. And he's also the founder of the Norwegian PowerShell user group, and also an open source advocate. Yes, That's welcome, right. Robert. So we're yes. really happy to have you here, uh, Robert. Yes. And actually, 
me and Jonah ha had some questions even before the session started. So <laughs> sort of the Q and A has already started there. But um, yes, but to today we're going to be talking. Uh, we're going to be hearing about Terraform and Azure. And can you tell us a little bit about what you will be presenting? So I'm going to go uh, rel relatively quickly through how Terraform works, uh, uh, because obviously if we're going to use it for Azure. We kind of need how to know how that works, but but also how to 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 start using it with Azure. And then I'm going to go and uh, actually start writing some code, and primarily show how you would go about finding out how to set 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 everything up. So it's it's a relatively you know at the beginner level. And obviously, uh, this is one of those uh, easy to learn but but hard to master kind of things because you can get really complicated. But I'm gonna stay out of the you know <laughs> uh, out of that uh, you know area of the you know really complicated stuff and just go through the basics and and, and make sure that people can get uh, up and running with Terraform on with Azure. Yes, exciting. All right. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yes, then I think we'll just leave the stage uh, to you, Robert. And also for for the viewers, if you have any questions, just just type them into into the comment, and we'll take them on the ways. And don't forget that we will have this live Q and A or talk discussion after after the session is over. Yes, that's right. Okay, uh, so best of luck, Robert. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me. It's uh, this is the first time I talk at the Swedish uh, as a user group. So it's primarily been doing stuff for the Norwegian one and the Icelandic one, and you know, uh, feel like I kind of I'm trying to like put a pin on every country in the world, especially now when you can do that since everything's digital. Uh, though I would rather prefer to you know travel and and hold things in person, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, so let's see if I can get my thing to work. There you go. Uh, so yeah, like uh, I don't need to to do a lot of introduction to myself, but but uh, my name is Robert, and I work as a cloud architect at Crayon Group. Uh, so I'm I'm primarily dealing with uh, trying to get uh, get more automation into infrastructure and and you know do things in a cloud native way at Crayon at the moment. Uh, I'm a, I call myself a cloud automator. Uh, so you know that's the, I guess that gives an idea to what I'm, I do. But I do a lot of things with open source and cloud native, and I, I sit as a uh, co-chair in the cooperative delivery working group under the CNCF, uh, uh, you know, uh, technical advisory group, app delivery. There's a lot of words in those things, but let's just say, and I, I, I sit there and try to find out what you know, how to approach things and how to make it easier for people to adopt cloud native things. Um, among other things, GitOps. I've been in the GitOps working group, uh, helped uh, start the Open GitOps uh, project and define the GitOps principles uh, and things like that. But uh, I know my introduction kind of lacked one thing, and that's the uh, the the new UC group that uh, uh, me and a bunch of nice people created. Uh, that's going to be an online UC group, so it's open for everyone in the world, uh, and it's called Azure Cloud Native. So the idea is to promote cloud native technology, but from an Azure perspective, and that's the kind of thing that we feel is missing at the moment. So, if you want to learn more about things like Kubernetes and you know infrastructure as code and GitOps and uh, all these cool things, then feel free to to find us on Meetup, and you probably could just follow me on, on Twitter or any other social media that I'm active at, which is just. Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, and uh, and I'll I'll be sure to spam you with a lot of things when when things are happening. The first one is actually this uh, February uh, the twenty second, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly. Uh, but it's with uh, Brendan Burns, which you know VP at the Microsoft, you know, one of the co-founders of Kubernetes. So you know he he, he kind of he, he knows what he's talking about. So that would be a good one. Anyway. The takeaways from this one is I want to make sure that people understand why why we do things with infrastructure as code, like what are the benefits, um, and a, a basic overview of how Terraform works, because then it will be easier to you know talk about how to use it with Azure, and then obviously how to use it with Azure, and hopefully an interest in learning more, like the, the maybe. Like I said, this is like the basic things. This is just getting started. Uh, there, and there's a whole world of opportunities out there when it comes to infrastructure as code. And uh, hopefully this just, you know, give you the nudge in the right direction when it comes to that learning path. 
Uh, I don't know if people have heard about the power of plain text, but it comes from the pragmatic uh, programmer. Um, it's uh, it's one of those like the, the, you know a couple of words that kind of explain something in a more profound way. I think it's really cool. Um, just the fact that whatever you do in the world is powered by just words and sentences that make sense. Like if something is greater than, then it should return this. Like just the fact that you can do that and all of a sudden you control everything in the world. It's just an awesome thing to think about. Um, and when it comes to infrastructure as code, one of the benefits of, of writing infrastructure as code is the, the well, there's, there's a lot of things that you have stuff like, um, like just the fact that you have one source of truth, you have, you have one place that is actually explicit telling you this is how your infrastructure should look like. Um, you you uh, you can do things in a, a standardized way, and you can reuse uh, your elements so that you have you know you have your resources set up in a very specific way, and and through like reconciliation loops that look at what's going on, you can also if someone tries to change that. In, in the in the wrong area, like on the resource itself, you you'll be you can be able to push that back and kind of go like, no, we're this this is the source of truth. It's it's what's defining code. Um, and one thing I often talk about is the code then becomes the documentation. Instead of writing documentation, this is how everything is set up. You you actually just have your documentation straight there in the code. Everything's defined in text. Um, and and something that I don't have the list there is just the, the like the, the speed of change that you can do. I, I keep on coming back to a, a project that I was on where we set up from scratch an entire uh, Azure uh, tenant with enterprise scale and everything. We had uh, virtual one, we had uh, VNS everywhere and a lot of those things. But it turns out that the ranges that was on the the on premise of that that customer didn't uh, the 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 the, uh, the IP address ranges we 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 overlapped we thought we didn't because we asked and then we didn't get the, the full answer back we just got like ah that that sounds like it's good turns out they overlapped um, and since this wasn't in production I just went then all right I'll just tear down the entirety of the enterprise scale uh, you know uh, Azure tenant deployments everything down. Change the uh, the uh, the cider range on the on the uh, on the on the appro in the appropriate places and then up again. So, you know, hundreds of resources, you know, down redeployed less than an hour. You know, you can't do that manually. That just doesn't work. Um, when talking about infrastructure as code, obviously, you know, CI/CD is a thing that's kind of kind of useful to have. It's one thing to do what we're going to do now, which is building the code and then running it from your local machine. But that makes it hard to cooperate with code, right? So you want to get it into some sort of CI, CD uh, pipeline of sorts. You want to do the, the like format checking. You want to do linting. You want to do like security checks uh, and other integration uh, checks. But it also helps uh, people to see like you know what what changed and who changed it because everyone if uh, you could uh, you could actually sit and work locally uh, just putting the the uh, I'll, I'll get to it later what it what it means but put the state of Terraform somewhere that everyone could reach but at that point you can't really see who did what all of a sudden something had changed and you go okay who did this like it, it, you can't really see that so. Um, having that, you know, run through a pipeline, you would actually then just see that, and obviously, then you can do automatic delivery and things like that, which, which uh, you know, can be really powerful. Uh, small changes you know, propagates all down the line until it's out in production if you're having good enough. So, while we're not gonna show CI/CD now, um, it is a very natural step after you kind of get the grips how to write Terraform. Um, so that could be, that could probably be a, a different uh, talk altogether. All right. So that's infrastructure as code, but what about Terraform? Um, well, Terraform uh, has a lot of things going for it. Um, it's an open source tool. So Terraform itself is 100% open source. 
there, there's nothing that's hidden behind any type of uh, enterprise agreement. Um, how HashiCorp then makes money on Terraform is they have something called Terraform Cloud, which is like uh, just pipelines as a service. So you can just point your files to Terraform Cloud, uh, and that takes up care of everything that you need for running Terraform. Right, so that's how they make money on on Terraform itself. But Terraform is at the core, one hundred percent open source. Um, Terraform is stateful, uh, which I kind of alluded to previously. But uh, what that means is that the changes that you do get stored in a state file. So uh, this differs from what a lot of other tools do, which is you 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 write your code, you change you you know, push the um, change to the API of whatever you're working against. And then that becomes, you know, the current state. Terraform differs in that it first creates a, a Terraform state file and then pushes the changes. Um, the, one of the main benefits of that is if you want to do, uh, if, if you want to do changes and stuff like that, and you then run a, what's called a Terraform plan, which will let show the change. You get instantaneously response like straight away. Uh, you also have something outside of the environment that says this is what we were supposed to have. So uh, that's why when people, if people do manual changes in 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 Azure, you actually have something to reference and say no, it's supposed to look like this. We have the state file here, which makes it a whole lot easier to keep track of and make sure that no one comes and you know ruin your stuff. Um, Terraform is declarative, just like anything should be. Uh, declarative versus imperative just means that uh, uh, if you if you define something declaratively, you say, this is what I want. So you say you want, you want a virtual machine. It should have this name. It should be in this virtual network. You don't go in and create the virtual machine and you know set the define the name manually and then attach a certain NIC and you you know for data disk you don't create a disk and put it in you you, could, you just say I, I want this to happen. Uh, the data disk is a, is a uh, bad example because I actually I'd make the disk, but not if you use the Crayon Terraform Azure RM uh, virtual machine module. Yay, you know, fine segue. We'll talk about that later. Um, it's modular, so uh, every every single part of Terraform is a module. So if the 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 root folder which you're working with, you you'll have like .tf files. That's where you run your Terraform uh, binary, uh, Terraform.exe or just Terraform if it's on other systems, uh, and that's then your root module. That's a module. It works the same way as any other module, but it's your root module. That's where you run Terraform. And that root module can then call out to different modules, called often called child modules or, or just modules for short. Um, so that's how you kind of uh, you know keep stuff dry. Don't repeat yourself. You can take a piece of code that you're going to repeat, and you can put it into module, and then you'll just be able to to uh, to call that piece of code whenever you need to. Uh, it's it's masterless and agentless, which means it's just one binary. It's just Terraform. Uh, so there's not there's no, nothing you have to set up there, uh, nothing like that. Terraform keeps track of everything. It does everything for you. Uh, platform agnostic. It works uh, with Azure. It works with AWS. It works with Google Cloud. It works with any private cloud thing, uh, vSphere, any any platform that has an API. It works with. Uh, how that works is uh, there's something called providers. So uh, a provider is just like a, a thing that is uh, used to define all the resources in that platform, and that does all the translation, translation for you. You don't have to define that in Terraform. Uh, and it's, it's written in Golang, so it's, it's on all platforms that you can build for Go, which is basically all. All right. We're soon going to actually look at code, so don't worry about that. Uh, working with Azure, relatively easy. You could use the Azure CLI, which we're going to be doing today, um, and just log in. And whatever you have access to, that's that's what you be able to hit with, the, with that approach. You can also use managed service identity if you run things on a, a if you set up your own agents or own machine in, in Azure that, that you want to be the 
the one that actually performs all this and all, obviously service principles with both client certificate and the client secret so uh relatively easy thing to set up um uh, usually you just use service principle with client secrets for ci cd and stuff like that uh so yeah makes perfect sense i hope um all right that well that's about it that's what i have for slides let's uh let's not look at slides let's look at code uh if i can all right so i have two windows that i'm gonna actually set up upright so and hopefully the text is is big enough and all it seems like it's it looks good to me i don't know but um so uh if we first of all yeah i think i'll do it this is the first time i do it in this approach but but um all right so on, on the left side here we have uh, a just a, a repository where we have three files we have a main.tf file we have an outputs file and we have a variables file uh, the naming of these is not random this is what's considered a standard you don't have to do this uh, terraform doesn't care what the names of the files are which is actually kind of great because at that point you can make things more logical to to, to you um, but if you're using tf lint or something like that to to look at how it sets stuff up it might actually you know flag that hey you don't have the default setup uh, the only th other thing i want to uh, highlight here before we actually do stuff is that i have this dot vs code um folder at the root level and a settings uh, dot json which have uh set up when i'm writing in terraform i'm going to format on save there there's no like thing that will break if you don't format things correctly but there is an actual standard approach as you can see here everything is aligned so if you have two lines of things together it would actually you know it would be this is how you want that to look so instead of you know me having to do that manual i just set up so you save it uh, and, and it happens. So um, Terraform is built up with some some uh, archetypes. Um, we have, uh, as we can see right now, what we have uh, on screen is a Terraform block. The Terraform block is where you put in basically your settings. Uh, and most uh, providers will then get defined under the required providers block. And as we can see here, I have the Azure RM one. Um, this is the newest, the new way of doing things, but uh, the current Azure RM provider, which in, is in the major version of two, um, has uh, a bit of legacy thing in it. So we need to actually also define the, it the old way, unfortunately. And there's a features block. So if you run new, your code without this, it just says, I, I need a feature block. It can be empty, but, but, but you need to have it. Uh, that's probably, that's one of the things that's going to go in version 3.0. Uh, if you go into the, uh, let's see if an uh, easy way to show this without trying to blow up the screen. Uh, does that work for people too? Yeah. So if you go into the registry.terraform.io, this is where you find all the providers and all the modules that people have created. And as you can see, there's 1,818 providers at the moment. So you can, through Terraform, you could basically work against anything you want. Uh, everything from uh, you know cloud platforms to stuff like Azure Stack or even define in Azure Active Directory or on-premise as Active Directory. You could define users through code. So you know uh, you can basically you know um, uh, work with anything you want in one and the same file. Uh, but what we're gonna do we're gonna look at the uh, Azure RM provider and these have this handy little thing here called use provider and it just shows exactly what i have here more or less except it doesn't have the features block which you need to have so that's kind of how you get to know how to use the certain providers uh, i'm not gonna let's see if i can full screen this. i'm not gonna uh, use the um, registry just yet because i know what i'm doing for, for now uh, when you do things in, in, in Azure, uh, I, I think we all know that we probably need to have stuff in a resource group, right? So how do we do that? Well, we have something called a resource 
block. That's how you define resources. Uh, uh, the good thing about you know VS Code and the integrations that HashiCorp has made for, uh, for it, the language server and the, the extension, you you get these uh, helpful uh, little things here like uh, like uh, the completion. But as soon as I press enter here, I also have this structure ready. And since I defined the Azure RM provider, I just get access to everything in the Azure RM provider and much more easy for me to find all the result, but the structure for any resource is Azure RM because that's the provider underscore. And for resource group, it's resource group. Yeah, surprise. Uh, so this is basically a resource block. You have your, you, you define it, start it with resource. You then say, this is the resource type that I want in this case, an Azure RM resource group. But then it also has this name. So this is a label. Uh, so if you create several resource groups, you need to be able to differenti differentiate them, right? You need, you need It needs to have some sort of label or some sort of name. So let's just call this one demo, because why not? And I know, because uh, I, I can remember two things, that uh, Azure R R RM resource group needs two things. It needs to have a name, which is required, and it should be a string, right? Let's call it this uh, RG uh, Azure user group Sweden. Uh, demo sure and the other thing that you need is a location um do, just, did i write it right west europe yes so, so let's just define that as west europe and now if i press save it automatically gets to format the way that we want it. Right, cool so if i now i'll i'll change this to uh can i just do the move to side panel that's a new wasn't worded like that before. All right, cool. Um, now in the folder, I have the things that uh, that I showed in, in the in the uh, uh, in sidebar and inside there. But uh, so so I I write a lot of TF. That's my alias for Terraform. So if uh, I, instead of trying to remember to write Terraform every time, I'll I'll be writing I'll I'll be writing TF. That just means Terraform, All right? So if I do a Terraform plan right now. Uh, apparently, I have a right now. Actually, that was actually what I was trying to get. I, I just see red text and I start going to troubleshooting mode. Uh, if I do, if I do a terraform plan right now, it's, it will say, you, you know, I don't understand what's going on because you need to initiate the, the folder. Um, so first of all, we need to do a terraform init. What Terraform Init does is just goes through and see, all right, this is the provider that you want. These are the modules that you want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what it does is it's creating a, a .terraform folder here, which basically just have the exe, in this case, is on Windows, but you know it would be just be a binary on, on, on Linux or, or Mac, uh, and just downloads the correct version and make sure that you have it locally. Uh, if I now do a Terraform plan, it's going to look at what's going on in the uh, in the uh, .tf files that I have here, and then spit out. This is what we will then try to make happen after a little bit of while, apparently. There, uh, that took a long time for some reason. Um, and there we go. We've got a, got a one thing that's getting getting created. It's the resource group. Makes sense. Um, and how you usually would do that at this point, let me just clear it so my face is not in the way. I'll, I'll, if, if I do, uh, if I want to apply this, then, uh, you know, strange enough, the, the command is apply. Uh, and you can see my autocomplete also shows there's an auto approve. And the reason why there's an auto approve is because I run this, what it actually does, it's taking, um, it's actually just running a Terraform plan because you need to know what you're applying, right? Uh, what you could do and what you usually do in a CI CD scenario is that you do a Terraform plan and output that plan to a, a file. Uh, you would then show that to, you know, if it's, uh, you know, to whoever's taking, you know, deciding to, to, to make it happen or not to show what's gonna happen. And if they approve it, you would then take um, and run a Terraform apply with auto approve, but using that plan file. Right, so you get the same result as you did the first time, just to make sure that that's what's happening. 
Uh, but yeah, sure, let's create a resource group. Why not? I'll say yes. And it will start spitting out these, uh, right, contacting, contacting Microsoft, saying hello, and everything like that. And for some reason, it's taken a bit while on my computer. I guess it's because I'm presenting. Um, but yeah, resource group doesn't take that long to create as soon as I actually can't able to contact Microsoft. And uh, it took uh, one second and I get my my everything uh, here. Uh, if I look at my way too many resource groups, I'm, I'm sorry for all the, the, all the text I could probably just refresh the thing. Uh, but yeah, we'll see here that we have a, uh, no, okay, maybe not. Let's refresh, oh, there you go. Uh, like I said, Microsoft is slow today. Here we go. We, we got our. There's nothing in it, but we have it, right? So that that's cool. Uh, but uh, but you know that that only goes as far. Uh, we 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 need to actually put something more in there. Uh, what can we put in? Uh, a, a virtual network. We need a virtual network, right? So what we then would do is of course, create a resource, which is an Azure RM, and I happen to know it's a virtual network. And we'll call this demo, uh, just because why not? Uh, I know that it needs a name, because it does. Uh, VNet Oaks demo. Um, it needs to be uh, placed in a resource group, and this is kind of where something cool comes in. I'm going to now reference the, the object that I already have, that is the resource group. So for resource group name, which is what it, it, and it automatically pops in as an object, I can then reference the Azure RM resource group dot demo. And if I press another uh, period, you'll see what kind of values that I can get out of this object, which is the object ID and the location and the name. So instead of writing uh, the name manually, which obviously also will work, I can just reference to the uh, to the resource group called demo, and if I need to change something there, that gets propagated throughout the entire thing. And same for location. I don't, I, I really don't want to uh, uh, slow. I, don't, I really don't. It, it should be in the same place, right? There are scenarios where you don't need that, but uh, but um, for you know, for now, I just want them in the same place. So save that. Uh, and it gets formatted. And one more thing that we need, and I'll show you how to, to find out what you can do with all this. But uh, one thing I know that we need before going, actually, I can I can maybe show that in, in, in flight. If you do a Terraform validate, it looks through your code and makes sure that it's you know, valid. Uh, and then here you go, yeah, you're missing something. Because uh, what's a virtual network if it's there is no address space, right? That makes no sense. So uh, I'll just jump down a couple, uh, put in an address space, and it already know that an address space uh, can have more than one side range, and that's a, a list of uh, strings. So uh, it helps me a bit there. I'll just do the very by default address that you usually do. And here, obviously, you can have commas separated out as many address spaces as you want. So if you now do a Terraform validate, it's going to say, hey, you're awesome. You remembered everything. And I'm going to say, all right, cool. If I do a Terraform plan, what we're going to see now is that there's nothing going to happen with the Azure resource, the, the resource group itself, obviously, because we didn't change anything there. But there's a new resource now. Um, Again, we may be slow, uh, and and here you get all the information that you that you that you probably need. And some things here says known after apply, um, and Terraform is really good at uh, if you reference an object uh, that has one of these known after apply, it understands that since I since this resource needs the other resource, and that resource has a known after apply. Uh, it kind of understands that, yeah, okay, obviously we need to wait for everything to get applied before uh, before we know this. So that's that's fine. You might get in a situation where uh, you have stuff in the module or or something to that effect, and you kind of break that uh, that that dependency graph that Terraform tries to keep track of. And at that point, you could do stuff like define uh, 
so you can define a depends on block and say this depends on a different resource and then those will kind of like the dependency graph will then understand all right cool we need to wait for this thing to happen uh, but that's beside the point uh, but uh sure so if we now look at see if i can there we go i'm so great at shortcuts um if we look at the documentation the, uh, obviously there's there's a bunch of stuff here uh but uh but i i usually just search for things but but we have a virtual we have a virtual network let's uh uh let's write virtual network uh, unfortunately, it, that that overlaps with a lot of things. But if you go down to network, you'll find the Azure RM version network. And if I, yeah, there. We go. So, um, at the moment, um, at the moment, uh, we have one um, one version network with no subnets. And if we look at the example code here, uh, it actually is defining subnets in the virtual network uh, resource, which you can do. Uh, so that's just inline, right? Uh, but one of the problems there is that sometimes you end up in a situation where you need to do a lot of things and reference that option. It gets kind of hard. So what I actually prefer to do, uh, I'm gonna, can, I, can I move this down now? All right. Change names for everything. So I'm not even sure if I did the right thing. Uh, what I prefer to do when creating a lot of subnets and, and that needs to be referenced back and forth, I, I'll, there, this, there's a standalone resource for a subnet. It, it's a bit more uh, work to 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 set it up, but uh, I, I just prefer it that way. So you don't have to do that. You might just have it in line, but and. The, the the Terraform uh, uh, registry uh, documentation is really good at this. You you kind of get the entire uh, everything that you need in in one view. You need obviously a resource group. You obviously need a virtual network, and this this is how you can set it up to work against that virtual network. And if you go further down, there's a bunch of these optional ones. There's there's uh, there's there's things you don't need. Which is why I know that the virtual network will come up because I know these are the things that I actually need, and everything else is optional. Um, right. But what if you, for instance, had a, a virtual network that's defined in a set of piece of Terraform code that's run in a pipeline, um, but you want to reference that in a different set? and uh because uh, you want to split up your life cycles right so you want to for instance create a kubernetes cluster you want to put that in a a, a subnet but you don't want to create that subnet there because that's part of like the the the, the uh the landing zone uh, uh configuration or or, or or what have you what you then would use is something called a data source so when we search for subnets, we also get the resource subnet and everything underneath there, but we also get the data sources. And the data source, as pretty much the word implies, is a data source. So you, you, it's a pointer that you can set up to say, I would need the data from this source, this Azure RM subnet called such and such, and, such, and then you can get the different outputs from it like and here uh, and here you can see you have the argument references where the arguments that you have for your data source is only three that you need but then you also have the attributes references which is the the uh, the uh, the uh, these here at the end that you can actually reference so you can reference the id of a subnet uh, if you need to do something against the object itself but also just getting out the address prefixes you you can uh, you know route table ids and everything like that uh, for instance, if you're setting up an AKS cluster and you want to put that in the subnet and you don't define the subnet there, you can then use the data source here. And then on for the subnet, use the ID to from the data source to fill that in. And that's kind of how you kind of interlink things, right? You don't need to have something running in, uh, uh, in that one particular piece of code. Um, I'm not sure how we're at the time. Uh, we have a little bit more left we can go through. Um, more examples. All right, so we have our uh, virtual network. We also want to 
uh, let's uh, not prom self promote it. That's the wrong way of saying it. But obviously now we have a, a virtual network. We can let's let's create a let's create a, uh, a subnet. Just I'm just going to copy code because why not? Um, and this this works more or less. Except you know it's pointing to all the wrong. Things. If I start writing examples for my examples, I might not have to do this. All right, there we go. So uh, if I now do a, again, let's move this to the side panel. Uh, if you now do a Terraform apply, because why not? First of all, everything should be a okay, hopefully. I think the code is correct. Uh, and then uh, if we get a plus virtual network plus subnet, I'll just say yes. And uh, I'll show us how to use modules. Uh, this looks good. It looks exactly this exactly what we wanted, right? Two to add, zero to change, zero to destroy. I'll say yes, and I'll start work on that. Um, I'm now gonna so creating a virtual machine in in Azure uh, can take a lot of uh, values. So if we start looking at uh, if, if you search for, it's just search for a virtual machine. First of all, uh, it's done already. First of all, what we see is we have a virtual Linux virtual machine. We have Windows virtual machine. So it's, it's differing there. Um, if you go in and look at it, we have, uh, where does it even start? Well, here we go. We have a lot of things. We, we can set like SSH keys. We can define how we want our OS disk, or we can any source image reference if you want a different specific server. We started looking at this. It's like, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, everything from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of extensions operations uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, dedicated host things. Uh, from uh, identity, how that should be working, the plan. If you want something from the marketplace, you need to define that very specifically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things here that's going on. Um, and we in Crayon create some a bunch of virtual machines. So we have a, a module for VMs that is, uh, if we can look at the, let's look at the code, just, just why not? There we go. Um, where we can do all these things, like create data disk, we can create the set of the backups, we can create up the set of the monitoring parts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we get as much as possible into one formatted code. Um, and we want to use that module instead of creating uh, things by ourselves. So if I, is this the button for it? No, oh, that's a completely different button. I created a new one. I wasn't supposed to do that. Let's just hide it. Can I then just making sure that I didn't break everything? Hide. Shouldn't update VS Code straight before doing stuff. But all right, so we have our thing is here now. Oh, that's cool. But it's it's already starting to get a bit crowded. Um, so if I go in here, I can create a new file and call this vm.tf. Like I said, from, from, from Terraform's perspective, you don't re it doesn't really matter. As long as you have a .tf file in the same folder, everything is fine. Um, I can see there's a request for moving me to the right. Uh, yeah. Um, I think there's a view where, or just remove it. It's much better. 100% improvement on visual stuff. Uh, <laughs> if we, if we, uh, so so we, we can have that in our own separate file. Terraform will just look at all the files and say, all right, cool, we have stuff. Um, so if I can ever type, I'll just write in, uh, uh, well, we can just copy this and then update the version. So what is the current version? The current version is 1.11. Cool. There are some parts of this that uh, uh, is needed, and unfortunately, I haven't been had the time to fix all to, to, you know, to make it easier for people. Look, so I'm just going to straight up look directly in the the variables file here, um, and and start you know looking at the things that I know that I need. I need I know that I need a name, right? So 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 this is how you define input variables. 
So all the things that I'm writing now, this is how you get that. Uh, I need a name. The name needs to be, I don't know, uh, VM, actually user group, Sweden, demo, because I'm very, uh, I, I can't imagine anything at this point. Uh, I know that a resource group is something I want. Um, and unfortunately, he it doesn't. It's not able to to auto complete the thing. So when I st write, start writing resource group, it, it it does something else. But if I do this now, and if I do a Terraform init, it should be. Uh, all right, I have a constraint issue. I don't want to go into that at the moment. I'll just try. I'll just bump the version. Wait, two. 285. Uh, let's do this full screen so I actually can see something. All right, so we we, we constrain versions on this module. Um, I'm going to try and make sure that that um, uh, is not an issue. And in, in, in the version two, we're, we're thinking of version 2.0. There's a lot of things we want to do differently. Uh, which is why I, I recommend using <laughs> using someone else's models instead of going through all this and, and figure everything out the hard way. So now we did Terraform Minute. Let's see if it actually managed to. Uh, no, it, it still wants to have that defined in the. Well, that's unfortunate. So so that that's kind of what happens if you put stuff into a module. Sometimes you just don't get the feedback that you would in a native resource, but. Uh, but you can still do stuff like uh, reference the Ashram Arm resource group. Uh, it's called demo and name. And I think it, I think it's more my machine than anything else at this point because it's, uh, it's a bit slow for basically everything. So um, it, I, I don't have to set location as I you know a year ago wrote in the description for this. It defaults to the location of the resource group. So if I don't do anything, that's that's cool. Uh, and other than that, we need stuff like this. Just copy this from the examples. That's a much better idea than trying to type out everything manually, right? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that we need here that I know. I know that we need it because I made this module. Um, and so I know that I'm going to create. So one of the things that I do is I take a, a subnet ID and I create um, I, I create the, the next for it uh, based on subnets. So I define the network uh, interface uh, subnets. And this is a, a list of objects. So you can see at the, the, the start, you have the, the, uh, the square brackets, which means it's a list. And then you have the squiggly brackets, which means it's an object or a map. And um, uh, and again, obviously this this is uh, something that came from the code. But you now reference the subnet name, uh, reference the uh, virtual network name that the subnet is in, and the resource group that the uh, you know that the subnet is in. And then I set the public IP ID and static IP to null, which means they don't get populated, but if you wanted you, you could set uh, a public IP and uh, have a static IP. Um, what I usually do is just, uh, where am I at? The virtual network. What I usually do is just do this, make that a period, <laughs> and then put a name. Um, uh, it's also demo, just to make sense to me. And the subnet is not it's called subnet. It's also called demo. Consistent. Uh, and I know uh, by default, uh, by default, I have a uh, this setup as a Linux server. So that's why the admin user then would then get set to uh, a username, Crayon admin in this case, and then just copy my public uh, SSH key from my local computer that can be you know a reference to anything anywhere um, and I know again like I previously mentioned it, it's gonna have an issue if I don't say that it depends on the, the resource group called demo in this case because the mapping gets broken when I when I put it out like this let's see 
is a different uh, question there. Uh, can you tell me what is data here and how we map uh, it to Azure Arm Server? So, um, what is data here and how we map it? So the uh, the uh, in this case we're not going to use a data source in uh, for for this right now we're using uh, the 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 resource we created because it's in the same terraform uh, uh, terraform root module but if i already had these uh, resources somewhere else uh, that's the point where i would then use a data source to reference that and at that point I, instead of having uh, for the uh, virtual uh, or the subnet name here, instead of Azure, having Azure RM underscore subnet, I would have a data dot Azure sub, uh, underscore subnet dot in the name of the the uh, data source. And at that point, I would get the same information. The, the only difference is I don't create that resource. I ask Azure to give me the information on that, uh, on that data uh, or that resource, if that made sense. Um, this should be it. All right, let's 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 try this out. And, you know, I, I might break something because why not? Uh, let's do a Terraform plan. Could do a Terraform validator. We could do a lot of things, but, you know, why, why do things the sensible way when we can just jump straight on it? Uh, obviously, at, at at this point, we're 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 kind of building things up slowly. But at a certain point, you get that speed up. Oh, yeah, missing it actually missing the requirement. That's uh, that's funny. So I, I I lied. I need to remember to put an issue for that. Um, all right. So location will just be the Azure Arm resource group uh, demo location and save. And again, it's really slow. So sorry about that. I wish I could say it wasn't my fault, but it's, it probably is, right? <laughs> because I took the liberty of updating my VS Code right before doing a demo. Yes. So. All right, let's try this again and see what we get. Um, there we go. So. What we see here now is, by the bare minimum, I would need two resources, right? We can see it down here. It says two to add, zero to change, zero to destroy. And if we look at it um, from all the way at the top, uh, I see there's a couple of changes here. That's the that's the yellow squiggly brackets, and that's just because these uh, these two. And I know I know this is just. I just happen to know that this is what happened. When you create a subnet that's completely empty, uh, it actually does uh, it require uh, the service endpoint policy IDs and stuff like that, and kind of it fixes that afterwards. So that just get added as as a thing afterwards. So uh, it's a bit silly, but that's just how it is. And, and the same with the, the subnet here, and we can see that the uh, virtual network has a update for the subnet because uh, it needs to add a security group and, and tags like that that are actually just missing. So, But that's not what we're looking for. That's just small changes that doesn't really bother us. But what we're looking at is the, the, the virtual machine itself. So as you can see here, instead of saying the uh, resource name and the, re and the, and the name, uh, resource name and the uh, resource type, sorry, and the resource name, here we have a, the name of the module, so the module uh, and VM, because that's the module name that we cho chose. And inside of there, we have the resources. So since I didn't uh, say that I wanted a win Windows machine, I got a Linux virtual machine. And it's setting all of these things. Um, but many of these are just like default values and stuff like that. But you have everything from, uh, from the public key if you want to copy that, sure, give me access to your stuff. So it's not really that secret. Um, you have st stuff like OS disk and, and things like that. And and then again, source image reference. So it's uh, Ubuntu uh, 18.04. That's by default. Um, if you change this to Windows, obviously, then you get a Windows virtual machine and not a, a, a Linux uh, resource and so on and so forth. But it also has to create the network interface 
which since I um, uh, didn't, I, uh, what I can do also, I, I also set it up so you can create the network interfaces uh, as a resource and then reference that into the module. But I want to make it as easy as possible. So just a list of subnets where you want things to land and you'll have your network interfaces. Um, and at a certain point, they start filling out this. This one virtual machine can all of a sudden be more or less 17 resources. So from a user perspective, that's that's that that's that's a lot. You know, I have to map all of these things and, and and stuff like that. But if you put it into a module, you can make it, you can translate it to easier things. You could say, uh, for instance, I think we have, uh, let's see. If you look at, uh, if you look at the code for variables and oh, backup, there we, we got we got backup. We could just say we want backup. We want to define the patch more. We want to do the time zone things, and we want them to do be in just certain you know uh, availability zones. One of the core things is the data disks. So you can you add a list of data disk objects to this instead of creating each of them. You're you know manually you could just you know uh, create a list of objects and then then sh just start populating it and the data disk is a resource but a data disk also need a resource that maps up uh, the connection so that's two resources so everything like this gets put into a module which you then can ju just reference uh in a much easier way let's see we you're using powershell to run this is the outperformer possible to get in objects does tfxe yeah so um actually it is standard out um so uh example things that i've been doing is using uh well actually here we go um if i want okay let's go back let's go back so if I do a, t a, t a Terraform, sorry, a state list, it will list everything that I have in my state. Um, if I do that, I can, uh, like the, the autocomplete already says, I can then do, use select string to select something, right? So uh, uh, demo, and that will be everything though, but oh, that's not a valid way of doing stuff. Uh, where is it? Right. Let's just say, uh, there you go. So for instance, you, you get, uh, you get, uh, you get matches there. Um, uh, but but as you can see, if you look at the the one that I already had, because it's a much cooler example than me just typing weird stuff. Uh, here, for instance, I needed to uh, to remove things inside a module called clusters, cluster, and I wanted to use uh, Terraform uh, taint. Uh, that that if you use that, then you taint a resource in the state, which means the next time you run a Terraform uh, apply, even if there's no change, it will destroy and redeploy. Um, so when you have things in modules, for instance, you end up having a lot of things. Uh, as we see right now, we only have two things here, but if we get to the point where we have 17 of these, I might want to taint certain things inside there, and I might just want to taint the 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 uh, or uh, data disks or, or something to that effect. And yes, at that point, you could just Run that through Terraform, uh, through PowerShell, and and just use normal logic to then taint each single file that you want. So that's possible. Uh, I also have uh, a. Um, um, can I just do? It? No, I can't. Apparently not. No, that worked. I also have a a a, a PowerShell module for Terraform. Uh, so uh, called TF Tools, because you might need to change Terraform versions. Uh, probably a lot also, because sometimes you define your code and set it up against one certain version of Terraform, and all of a sudden you go like, oh, crap, uh, I don't have that installed. So uh, there's there's tools for that, but but 
they are often not for Windows. So that's kind of why I created the, the TF Tools one. And there's a lot of bugs and stuff like that. But <laughs> what you can do is to install Terraform. And it will ask if you want version a certain version of the latest one. And I know there's a new one. So it was version 1.1.5. And I want that to set to active. And if I do a Terraform version, I should have 1.1.5. Yeah, there you go. So that just makes it easier. And, and um, I'm going to put in some state manipulating things into there as well as soon as I get time, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, how to roll back changes in Terraform? This is a great question, because now my demo is over. And I, I don't want these things, right? I, I want to clean stuff up. Uh, so there, there's a lot of ways you can do it. Like I said, you could either taint certain resources or just remove them from your config if you don't, just want them go, gone altogether. But uh, now, as we're at the end, I can do a Terraform destroy. And I want to do an auto approve because I just want to get stuff oh, gone fast as possible. And then it will do, again, a Terraform plan or a Terraform destroy plan. Uh, and it will say, uh, I'm going to remove every single thing and as soon as I get yeah. All right, there you go. So all these will be gone. Is that cool? And since I said automatically yes, it's just going to start deleting everything. So uh, perfect for labs and things like that, right? It, it makes perfect sense for labs. It's uh, you 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 wanna you wanna deploy a, a VM to do something and then destroy it right afterwards and then redeploy it. It's so much easier to just define it in Terraform. And then do a Terraform apply auto approve. You got your things up. You do your things. You need to reset. All right, Terraform destroy, Terraform apply, and everything's gone and, and up again. Easy peasy. I think that's what we have time for, uh, right? While we're destroying stuff. Yes. Um, yeah, I think uh, that was a very, very nice uh, session here. So we yeah. also have some additional questions that I think we didn't take up here that we can take. So there's a question from Ashis. Ashis who says, can I use different <clears throat> TF modules which requires different version of Azure RM providers? So here's the, here's the magic role thing. Uh, for, for this provider block, for instance, if you don't do anything, this is by default what you're going to use, right? But what I can do, uh, I can uh, actually define an alias here and say that this is the subscription for management, for instance. Uh, if I then need, and I can define as many of these as I want, right, for all different subscriptions. And, and I would at this point, I think it's outside of the... Yeah, so here you would set your subscription ID to whatever it is. Um, that's not an ID, but whatever. Uh, and then on the resources themselves that you want to uh, use a certain against a certain uh, subscription, uh, you could at this point uh, put in a provider, and then you will get the Azure Arm dot management, for instance. So that's kind of how you can set up all these you know, different ties and 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 separate providers. Um, for uh, versioning, that gets a, little, gets a little bit more tricky. Uh, so at that point, you want to make sure that everything that you're doing kind of uh, lands in the same, uh, you know, that something didn't broke before. But but obviously, as the, the, there's not a lot of major changes. Uh, version 2 has been the you know major version for a long time for Azure RM, and they're still working against version 3. Most things work, uh, you know. There's there's not a lot of breaking changes, so uh, unless you're really unfortunate with the the resource and what you're working against, you know, it should be fine. Mm -hmm. And I also had a follow up question. So the f the first question was this that you already answered from from mm -hmm. both sides. Was as ask if TF, uh, TFXE output the information or output stream so I can capture it in a variable and look at it. And mm -hmm. then he followed up this question with. But you can change the output to, for example, JSON and parse it as objects like you can with Azure CLI. And so, so yes, uh, if you if you do a Terraform help, I think uh, you 
could just get it out as um, JSON. Uh, I can't remember how to do that. But in in the in the back end of this, obviously, it is just JSON because what 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 H, the, the Terraform HashiCorp you know languages, it basically just taking these things and then mapping them to JSON. So so it's built on JSON, so you can get out the Terraform uh, JSON files. Uh, but uh, and what was the follow up? You can't change the output to, for instance, JSON and parse it as an object like you can bit. Uh, you, yeah, like I said, you can. I just can't remember how to get it out as JSON at the moment. Sorry, uh, and that's kind of how in the in the Terraform uh, um, uh, PowerShell module, uh, that's kind of how I would do things to get it more concise and have something to to reference. All right. Yeah, nice. yeah. Mm -hmm. no more questions. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Robert. It was a really great and live interactive live coding session. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it didn't break that much. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy. <laughs> I, I can't do it myself, doing the talk at the same time, doing the coding and handling the technical, but you're great. You did great. I hope the the, the audience have learned a lot today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have actually, we want to remind our uh, learners to uh, scan the QR code on this link and also uh, join us on Zoom uh, after the session soon. Yes. Yeah. Um, so just click on the, uh, for the Azure Learning or Badge, you can just click on the link, scan the QR code, and uh, for joining us, if you have time, uh, join us in Zoom for a discussion uh, using the bit.ly link that we shared uh, in here. Yes. All right. <laughs> oh, okay. yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So then I think uh, there are no more uh, no more questions here on the on the chat there. But you got a lot of nice, positive feedback here. Thank uh, you, Robert. Yes. Uh, great, great Thank session, and great, great live demo, and many other. Yes, really appreciated. I, I think we got a first uh, comment also about our t-shirts. Uh, nice, oh. cool t-shirts. Uh, says I think Gabriel. He said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, yes. Thank you. All right. So yes, uh, it's it's time to end the session again. We're having fun. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. Are you joining us uh, at Zoom? If yes. Have... I just need to yeah. turn on my coffee machine. Yeah. Uh, sure. And then so... get the coffee out of it. Yeah. Uh, sure. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. so yeah, so uh, thank you everyone. And if you want to join us, grab some coffee or something to drink and see you in Zoom soon. Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah.